Okay, uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Fisher. I'm a professor of political science here at the university and director of Brunel Public Policy, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to this evening's event. Uh, I've got with me two fantastic colleagues, uh, Dr. Varun Uberoy and Dr. Pamela Nika, uh, and we're going to be talking about themes around uh, monarchy in the 21st century. So we're going to have relatively short presentations. I'm going to kick off to set the scene. Um, then I'm going to ask uh, Varun and Pamela some questions that arise from the presentations, and then we'll have time for some questions at the end. And I'm reliably informed at the end that there are some sandwiches. So, uh, so it's well, well worth sticking around for. So um, <clears throat> let me just kick off and uh, set the scene. So th these are our speakers today. Um, so what I wanted to talk about at the outset, just to set the scene for Varun and Pamela's talks, was to, just to think about a little bit about Britain's view about the monarchy. Obviously, we've had a, a new king crowned on Saturday, and obviously there's been a lot of discussion in the press, not only about the coronation, but also about the various protests, particularly from groups who, who don't approve of the monarchy, who want to get rid of it. So I thought it would be really useful for us just to think about and ha uh, have a little look at the data on what people think about the monarchy. And I think the first point, and what, something I want to stress uh, throughout my short presentation, is that actually the foundations of approval are pretty stable over time. They do jump about a bit, but overall they're pretty stable. And what's very clear from where we have data on these things is that events can have a big impact on levels of approval both in a positive sense and a negative sense. So not surprisingly, events like the death of Princess Diana and more recently Harry and Meghan and also Prince Andrew tend to have uh, exert a downward pressure on approval. But equally, <clears throat> events like the Queen's Jubilee uh, and things like the Queen's visit to Northern Ireland where she shook hands uh, with Martin McGuinness, uh, who you may remember was a very prominent Republican politician in the north of Ireland, was seen very, very positively. So that's tended to lead to upticks. So if we look back over 30 years where we have data on this, the preference for a monarchy over a republic has varied between 60 and 80%. So it's pretty strong support for monarchy. By way of contrast, enthusiasm for a republic has not risen over 22% in the last 30 years. And it's important to stress that that's included many negative events for the monarchy, particularly in the last few years. Now, lots and lots of journalists get terribly excited when they see polls and say, oh, the support has fallen and so on and so forth. But actually, it would be extremely unusual if there was universal enthusiasm for the institution. And indeed, if we look at democratic institutions like Parliament, other institutions of democracy like the judiciary, etc., etc., they often, they themselves often attract limited levels of support. So if there's opposition to, to the monarchy, we shouldn't be surprised. What's interesting is whether it's not it's changed over time. So I wanted to show you some data on this. And this is data that goes up to 2021 from the British Social Attitudes Survey, which is a regular survey. Um, and in fact, they only started asking the question regularly from 1994 onwards because it just wasn't seen as an issue. When they did the first question in 1983, something like 85% of the population thought that the monarchy, having a monarchy was, or, was either very or quite important. And as you can see here, um, it's been pretty stable. It's taken a little bit of a dip over the last few years, and not surprisingly, that's coincided with events like uh, Prince Andrew's interview on television, 
but also the Harry and Meghan affair. But it's still worth stressing that although it's taken a dip, there's still over 50% of the population thinking it's very or quite important to have a monarchy. Another way of looking at this is to ask people whether or not they would prefer a republic or a monarchy. And what we have here, are the best way of measuring this is to calculate what we call a net score. A net score simply, simply subtracts one set of figures from another. So in this case, it's the percentage of people saying they want a monarchy minus the percentage of people saying they want a republic. And in actual fact, in the most recent period here, we can see there was an uptick in enthusiasm for the monarchy, although that dipped, not surprisingly, coinciding with more recent difficult events. But in general, the, the net score has been between around 45 uh, and went up to at least uh, to nearly 70% in net terms. So pretty stable and pretty strong support overall. What about individuals? Well, it's certainly the case that the Queen herself was extremely popular. Even amongst those who don't favour a monarchy, she was much admired. And I think what's important to stress there is that if you have a very popular predecessor, it is a very hard act to follow. Uh, so when you have a particularly popular prime minister, for example, the person who follows after them is inevitably never quite as popular. Think Gordon Brown after Tony Blair, think John Major after Margaret Thatcher, etc., etc. And certainly, King Charles has always been less popular than the Queen, but as we'll see, he's becoming more popular these days. But interestingly, the King's uh, eldest son, Prince William, continues to be very popular, as we'll see at some points even rivaling the Queen for popularity, though he has taken a dip more recently, coinciding with the Harry and Meghan affair. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters because in levels of individual popularity of the key personnel are likely to affect support for the monarchy, both positively but also negatively. So here we are. The, the blue line is the Queen, and you can see that the Queen uh, rarely dipped below 80% uh, net score. That's positive minus negative, so very, very positive. Prince William actually outdid her uh, in the period of the late teens, but took a dip in popularity after the Harry and Meghan affair. And then Prince Charles is the green line. And as you can see, he's never been as popular, but more people have always liked him than disliked him. And as you can see from the graph, his popularity is growing. Now, we'd expect that a little bit, because he's just become king, and the coronation will have boosted his popularity. But it's clear that he's not as popular as the Queen was, but equally, it would be an exaggeration to say that he's generally unpopular. But we do get variation by groups. Now, this particular first variation of age was one that lots of journalists picked up on from a recent poll from YouGov, where they found that people aged between 18 to 34 were more likely to disapprove of the monarchy than approve of it. Well, that's true, but it's always been true. And in fact, the gap in terms of approval and disapproval between the youngest group surveyed and the oldest group surveyed has been the same as it was 30 years ago. So in general, it's fair to say that as people get older, they become more in favour of the monarchy, or at least they disapprove of it less. I think that maybe the latter is a more accurate way of putting it. But certainly, just as we see with political attitudes, uh, sadly for everybody, you don't stay young forever. And as people get older, their uh, opinions evolve. But we also see variation amongst Britain's uh, ethnic minority population. Now this, I should say at this point, is a fairly crude measure 
um, because on the basis of a uh, uh, an opinion poll, you can only really make differentiation between white and non-white Britons. Okay? We can't differentiate between the various different ethnic groups. But nevertheless, as a general rule, ethnic minorities are less likely to favour the monarchy than uh, the white majority. In terms of country, we find that Scotland is the least pro-monarchy area in the UK, but they're still more likely to favour the monarchy than not. And within England, London is the area where people are less li least likely to favour the monarchy, but again, they're more likely to favour it than not. So it's a relative level of uh, support. So we do get variation. It's not, it's not uh, unanimous or anything like that, but these are the sorts of key areas. Interestingly, we get no variation by class, for example. These are the principal ones whereby you can observe variation in terms of approval. What are the future then? Well, this is a really neat question that Ipsos asks people. It's been asking people since 1990. Whether or not they think there will be a monarchy in the next 10 years, in the next 50 years, and in the next 100 years. So the blue line is the next 10, the green line is the next 15, and the red line is the next 100. And again, these are net scores. So if you're below zero, people think it's less likely than more likely that there will be a monarchy. So, so we're looking for, uh, if that goes below the line, it means people think that the monarchy will disappear. But what we can see very clearly is that in the short term, in the next 10 years, it's been pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, stable. Most people think that the monarchy will be around in 10 years. In terms of 50 years, well, people are less sure, not surprisingly. 50 years is a long way away. But what's curious, I think, is that far from that figure going down below the line consistently, it's actually been picking up. So it's now above the line. So in the medium term, people think there will be a monarchy. In the much longer term, 100 years, people are far less sure. But that gives us a clue about both approval but also whether or not th people think the institution will last. So, just to conclude before I hand over to Baron. In the short term, as King Charles is crowned, what I want to stress is that the foundations of support for the monarchy are pretty stable. Okay? We get blips, but fundamentally the, the UK supports the institution of the crown. Secondly, King Charles is not as popular as the Queen. And it, to be honest, I doubt very much where, whether anybody would have been as popular as the Queen would be. So this may, may affect support for the institution if he doesn't do well. But at the moment, he's gaining in popularity. But interestingly, one of the things he suggested is slimming down the monarchy, engaging in less activity. But paradoxically, this may make the monarchy less popular. Because as Britain becomes more divided with stronger regional and national identity, a monarchy that becomes focused solely on London, because it doesn't have the capacity to travel to the four corners of the United Kingdom, is likely to generate much less support. So ironically, Prince Charles' idea of slimming down the monarchy may actually lead to less support for it. In, in other words, it may be cheaper, but it may shorten the life of the institution. In the medium term, the public is unsure whether there will be a monarchy. But at the moment, certainly in, over the next 50 years, more people think there will be than won't be. But interestingly much rests on Prince William. Obviously, at some point, Prince William will become king. And if he continues to be, popular, uh, to be popular, and he's certainly more popular than his father at the moment, 
the prospects for continuity in the monarchy are likely to rise. So, I hope that's given you a good background. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Varon, uh, who's going to talk about whether King Charles is a traditionalist, a multiculturalist, or both. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to address this question. Is King Charles III a traditionalist, a multiculturalist, or both? My starting point is a little bit divorced from the monarchy, and I'll get to it very quickly, though. My starting point looks something like this. Various eminent scholars and some public intellectuals make the claim that multiculturalism requires abolishing, removing various national institutions and traditions. And here's just one example from a, a recent book by uh, Rude Koopmans and Leo Orgard. In Western societies, there are growing demands for the adaptation of the majority culture and its different expressions to minority demands and rights. For instance, calls have been made for France to abandon the principle of laïcité to accommodate the reality of multiculturalism. In the United Kingdom, there have been voices to revisit the Church of England to fit in with the United Kingdom's changing demographics. So we have this debate. If we want multiculturalism, can we preserve certain traditional institutions? Some people say we can't. Uh, what is ah, uh, it's the French conception of secularism. Um, so the debate in France looks something like some Muslims want to wear a headscarf in schools. Um, various French officials from French Prime Minister, previous French Prime Ministers on down have argued that the principle of laïcité bans that, and they have argued otherwise. Okay. Now I want to take issue with this debate, and I want to say, well, the coronation displays how we can have multiculturalist ideas that are compatible with retaining much of what the majority wishes. And so think for a minute about the coronation itself. You had a quintessentially Church of England Anglican ceremony. No one could mistake it for being anything else. The king continues to be defender of the faith. This is a reference to the Anglican Church. Britain's first Hindu Prime Minister read from the Bible. However, there were also new elements. Minority faith leaders were involved in the ceremony, both in the middle and at the end of it, in fairly prominent ways. The new king asked to be a blessing to all faiths. The idea was to preserve the Church of England, retain its centrality, but also include minority religious groups. And this was largely how Justin Welby thought about the ceremony, but perhaps more importantly for my argument, this is the way in which multiculturalists have talked about the inclusion of minorities since the 1990s. They have argued that minority faiths should be given additional, though not equivalent, status to the Church of England. And the argument that they've offered looks something like this. Regardless of the current number of adherents of the Church of England, the Church of England has undoubtedly influenced Britain's history, institutions, its people, its moral and political life, far more so than any other faith. However, it is also undoubtable that minority religions have influenced Britain over the last 70 to 80 years. Go up the road to Southall, you will find some churches, but you're more likely to find Gurdwaras, temples and mosques. That is not just true of Southall, that is true of various parts of London. It's also true of various parts of Leeds, Leicester, Birmingham, Manchester, Bradford and so on. 
The ceremony was designed to say something in part about Britain's character. This is explicitly stated by the Church of England. You cannot talk about Britain's character without including minority faiths, but you do not need to displace the Church of England to do so. Now, some may say that this is a result of some of the polling that Justin was referring to. For example, a recent poll showed that 49% of ethnic minorities think that the royal family has a problem with race and ethnicity. Only 38% of ethnic minorities said that the monarchy should continue. Now, I think as Justin rightly said, those polls are quite crude, but Perhaps more importantly, far from a response to recent polls, this is a stance from the monarchy that has been in the making for a very long time. In 1994, Prince Charles announced that he didn't want to be defender of the faith, he wanted to be defender of faiths. This would have demoted the Church of England, removed its historical role, and so in 2015, he clarified that he wanted to continue to be defender of the faith, but also protector of faiths. This preserves the centrality of the Church of England, but also includes minority religious groups. Likewise, just after his accession, the king said that he would affirm his commitment to the Church of England and its establishment. But he also referred to Britain as a community of communities. Now, this term has been used by many people. But in, in relation to describing Britain, it is how multiculturalists have long referred to Britain so as to capture the fact that Britain's ethnic and religious communities helped to shape Britain as a national community. Prince Charles, sorry, King Charles, seems to want to both not displace the Church of England and to include minority religious groups. He's showing how it can be done. But what about those of no faith? In the last census, 22.2 million of us said that we have no faith. Now, one might think that these people want a coronation to be either less religious or not religious at all, instead of multi-religious. Now that, of course, assumes that those 22.2 million people support the monarchy. But more importantly than that, a recent large Theos survey showed that only a third of those who say they are of no faith are actually opposed to religion. About a third say that they are spiritual, but not religious. And it's difficult to know exactly what that means from the research, but still, that is a view that many people have. Likewise, about another third say that they are tolerant of other religions, but it's just not for them. So only about a third of those who say they have no faith would necessarily oppose this idea of religion being part of the coronation. But let's imagine, just for a minute, these people get what they want somehow. Well, there would still have to be some inclusion of minorities to avoid excluding a great many of them. And many of these minorities see themselves as Jews, Muslims, Sikhs, and so on. It is very difficult to simultaneously reduce religion and include minority religious groups. So now we're talking about excluding minority religious groups. Indeed, including these minority religious groups while displacing the Church of England would look inconsistent, because if the idea is to reduce religion, why include minority religious groups? It would also hamper interfaith relations because it would look like some religions were being privileged while others were being displaced. And it's likely to provide ammunition for those who want to stoke fear about the white majority being displaced. 
If we want to keep the monarchy in the Church of England, then the multiculturalist approach that was used seems to have been the right one. Well, what are the implications? Well, first, I think multiculturalist ideas have shown how to include minorities but without displacing majorities. And those who argue otherwise are not only misinterpreting texts, they're now ignoring an example that many millions of us around the world have seen about how this can be done. But is this enough? I doubt that anyone could possibly argue that that's the case. There are a whole range of very large questions such as whether the monarchy should not only apologize for slavery and the empire, but what redress is also due to a great many people around the world. However, the use of this multiculturalist approach looks like a good start. I'll stop there. Hello everyone. Um, so my presentation will be slightly different. I think we uh, heard some very interesting stuff from a um, political science point of view. Uh, I'm a lawyer myself and a lecturer at Brunel Law School. Um, so this presentation uh, was meant to be uh, together with Vicky, uh, but unfortunately she's not here today. So it's divided into two parts. We're looking mainly into the role of monarchs and portraits into banknotes starting with the UK in the first part, and then I'll move into a more modern or postmodern example of the euro currency. So starting with the early banknotes in England, um, banknotes were always of fundamental importance, a very important device for the local trading communities. The first banknote was issued in the 1500s um, by goldsmiths in London, and then um, the IOU paper notes uh, were pretty much uh, put in place of gold. So one pound of gold was equivalent to one pound uh, of a paper note. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of um, multiple issuers around London. So banknote issuers, uh, what they had to do is pretty much encourage uh, those participating uh, in, in this trading community, in this mercantile uh, trading community, to accept, to use uh, those banknotes and to accept them as, as uh, means of exchange. And obviously images and visualization were very important key elements in sort of like encouraging confidence, public confidence um, and trust uh, to these uh, banknotes so that they would make sure that they would either be repaid or exchanged to gold. So they became pretty much elaborate pieces of art so in this banknote here of Halifax Joint Stock Bank of 1830s, you can see on the left-hand side um, King William IV. And even though King William was actually not uh, local to Halifax, interesting fact, um, they used this image uh, just to give legitimacy to those banknotes because they weren't legal tender. So there was no government to sort of like underwrite um, the promise that these banknotes will be paid um, or exchanged into gold. Um, so as you can see, that was quite important. And then um, I don't know whether you can read that at the, um, at the, very, at the first um, icon there. It says, I promise to pay the bearer of this note. So clearly, apart from the monarch appearing on the banknote, we also have a written promise for these notes to be paid. Um, which is an interesting fact. We still have um, of that in some notes nowadays, um, so it's kind of interesting. And at the back, we see uh, the image of Britannia, a very classic one, a traditional one. Um, so pretty much all these banknotes of that time were representation of the communities um, they were part of, and they had this identity factor, and the monarchs they served um, uh, as sort of like guardians of legitimacy of these banknotes. Um, now, of course, Bank of England notes 
They came a bit later. They became legal tender um, in 1833. You can see here on the um, left-hand side, Bank of England note of 1918. Uh, so the monarch appears on the right-hand side. So that's um, King George VI. And then you've got the image of Britannia on the left-hand side and those glorious spiral patterns uh, at the back. Um, slightly different, um, the uh, 1970 20 pounds banknotes. Um, we've got the Queen Elizabeth II here, uh, featuring on the banknote, along with important um, uh, historical figures, such as William Shakespeare. So again, representation of monarchs pretty much started from the 20th century onwards, appearing on those banknotes. Um, now, the Commonwealth countries, uh, the, it looks slightly different. So we can see that the Queen, it does feature in some of the banknotes, uh, but it's sort of like a blend of the monarch, the Queen in our case, the Queen Elizabeth II, together with some national identity symbols. So it's sort of like a blend of two. Uh, the monarch, um, uh, of course, included, but for instance, if we see the East Caribbean note, uh, of 1965, we've got the Queen on the right-hand side, and then on the left-hand side, the islands that were part of the East Caribbeans. And then in the uh, Cayman Islands note, we see the Queen on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, uh, we see this um, national uh, crest and this beautiful fish. Um, so, and all these geometric, I would say, patterns to um, they serve uh, sort of like security, protecting them from fraud, etc. But again, uh, the likeness of the queen, it's very prominent here. But it was different, uh, in, it wasn't the same in all Commonwealth or the British Empire um, countries. Um, it was slightly different in some of them. The queen would appear in some of the notes and in other notes it was just national symbols or national heroes portrayed in there. So it was sort of like a mix of two, I would say. Now. Of course, nowadays, the situation is slightly different. Um, there is a trend of avoiding um, uh, including monarchs uh, in the banknotes. And that is part of a wider discussion uh, as to the underlying reasons for that. I'll touch upon that as well. Uh, but as we can see here, a good example is the Australian banknote. Um, if we consider that there's 50, around 50 Commonwealth countries King Charles III would be the head of state just uh, in a few of them, uh, not in all of them. Um, and the Australian, uh, five Australian dollar, uh, we can clearly see the queen here. And there's a blend again of the monarch and national identity um, uh, patterns, figures, etc. Uh, so they've expressed, that they've clearly, Australia clearly said that the new banknotes, the, the, the new uh, five Australian dollar banknotes won't be including um, King Charles III. And that is part of the discussion, I think, of uh, this um, uh, uh, willingness of them to become a republic. So I think that is the underlying reason as to why the monarch won't be included in the new uh, banknotes. Canada, um, there's quite a few banknotes uh, featuring the Queen. Um, they haven't made it clear, so we don't know yet whether King Charles III uh, would actually uh, be featuring into any of those uh, banknotes. Uh, so there's no update that have remained silent. So it's interesting to see what they will do. Um, and as I said before, um, the occurrence, I would say the appearance of these uh, monarchs on, on banknotes it's part of a wider discussion of representation, communities, and identity. So there's two questions, I would say. A, um, who is the head of state? And whether that specific nation ought to be a republic. So this is the debate, I would say, as to whether to include the monarch into the banknotes. Um, and of course, this is also linked with the history of the British Empire. Uh, and the whole discussion about um, uh, the, the way that some individuals were used, uh, enslaved, uh, etc. The whole discussion about the production of goods back in the days 
and some nations they sort of like perceive um, the, the, the portrait of the king, of the monarch in their banknotes as, as sort of like a representation of that past, um, hence the reluctance into including those uh, into their banknotes. Now the question is how they will retain, legally speaking, how they will retain uh, that commonwealth identity if the monarch is sort of like removed altogether from the banknotes uh, for the countries that will still remain um, in the Commonwealth. So uh, that is something uh, that perhaps is interesting to follow. Uh, now I will cover, I don't know whether I've got much time, I will cover the Euro banknotes, which is the representation of the opposite, <laughs> to be fair. There's no portraits, there's no monarchs, um, there's uh, just buildings, bridges, windows, <laughs> uh, you call it. Um, quite different. So the Euro, the origins of the Euro, they lay back in the Maastricht Treaty, which is the statute of the European Union back in the 1991, um, which it was part of this wider project of creating the European Union um, uh, monetary and uh, uh, common union. And the Euro was at the heart of it, together with establishing, of course, the European Central Bank as the guardian of the Euro, this common currency. So. Um, nothing of those pictures is actually random uh, if we see that. Interesting fact, initially, um, um, the idea, uh, sort of like legally speaking, um, it came about in 1991 with the Maastricht Treaty. The euro was adopted around 1999 as a non-cash monetary unit, initially, and it was only to 2002 um, that actually coins and banknotes were circulating into participating uh, member states. There were around 12 to start with. Now we've got around 20 member states adopting the euro. So, and, and it's, it's um, interesting because this is not a individual country currency. Uh, is the, the currency of this regional formation, of this large regional formation. Hence, it is called a supranational banknote, and it's actually the first supranational banknote. So um, the whole idea of including portraits or important historical figures or even monarchs featuring on these banknotes, uh, it wasn't even part of the discussion because it's very, as you can imagine, being all these um, member states, uh, and the diversity that Europe um, represents, it's pretty much impossible uh, to not favor a country um, if you are to decide what portraits, what monarchs, what national figures would actually be included in these, um, in, in these banknotes. But interesting fact is that all, the, um, all these images that you see here have been very carefully selected. So the windows, for instance, and the bridges um, are they representing this sense of openness and cooperation of the European Union integration. From an historical point of view, they represent different architectural styles, which they pretty much reflect the history of Europe and what they have in common as, as, as a shared history. Um, even the sort of like the protecting features, like the hologram and the watermarks, um, they do feature Europa, which is a creature of Greek mythology, uh, and it pretty much is the face of Europe. So everything is very carefully selected to pretty much signify this common identity that was so hard to be achieved, right? As we can see, when it comes to a nation featuring um, the monarch, featuring a national figure, it just served as this sort of like unifying element. Here, we've got a very different example. Um, a very difficult balancing act, I would say. So all the images, all these uh, visuals, uh, they had to serve a purpose and pretty much unify the, um, the member states. And um, what this symbolic, I would say, um, role of the currencies for the European Union countries was also one of the reasons why a few European Union member states, including the UK <laughs> back in the days when it was part of the EU, um, they were reluctant in joining the Eurozone because of this uh, very, very strong uh, meaning, symbol of their currency, historical um, meaning, 
and also economic reasons, of course. But it was one of the reasons um, that was brought forward. Now, it's, it's interesting because the paper notes, like the bank notes, as you see them here, they all featuring these neutral um, sort of like images. And it's considered, if you, uh, if you um, read um, the second uh, bullet point that I've got here, it's interesting because it says um, that is recognized, the euro is recognized as postmodern banknote. And if we think about all this notion of postmodern design of currencies, it's pretty much, it has to be so neutral, not linked with any portraits, people, national figures, but sort of like representing something a bit more neutral. Um, and, and Euro does that in a way, and it reflects the highly sort of like um, egalitarian idea that Europe is all around us, in bridges, in windows, in buildings, everywhere, but it's nowhere in particular. So it's shared among the member states which is an interesting fact. Um, now, as I mentioned before, with the coins now, we've got something different because the banknotes, you can see all these images that are neutral, they represent the history of Europe and how these ar architectural styles have sort of like influenced uh, the member state and this, representing this common link, this common identity of Europe. Uh, coins, on the other hand, they've got two sides. They've got the supranational side, so the common side designed by the European Union with all these neutral figures, and they've got the national side where the member states can pretty much include anything they want uh, in terms of their national figures, etc. Interesting fact, you don't quite see portraits, monarchs, um, faces of people there, because even those being part of this new Europeanization trend, even those um, are carefully selected to represent this sort of like openness to the integration process. So it's interesting to see that because there are authors that argue, well, that's sort of like part of the um, a diplomacy uh, sort of like attitude, um, whereas other people say, no, it's actually a trend towards Europeanization and potentially political union. So two, side, <laughs> uh, two sides of the debate. What is more contemporary nowadays, even more uh, uh, even more, I would say, detached uh, from figures, from statutes, from monarchs, for anything that you know, it's digital currencies nowadays. So both in the UK and uh, at European Union level is this attitude about uh, introducing digital means of payments that are to be issued by the central bank, either at national level or at supranational level be it, in our case, the European Central Bank. So interesting fact here is that they do not actually intend to replace cash. Believe it or not, based on recent surveys, 79% of Europeans, they actually use cash. They don't like uh, electronic means of payment. They rely on cash. So there's a lot of euro in circulation. Um, on the other hand, to keep up with the competition, all these alternative means of payment, the European Central Bank uh, has come up with this idea that is actually work in progress, uh, adopting this digital euro um, that everyone will have access to. So it's central bank digital money that everyone will have access to, to sort of like enable ease of payment uh, and access to central bank digital money straight away. It's a very challenging process. Legally speaking, uh, it might be, um, it might trigger an amendment of the Treaty of the European Union because the European Central Bank has been designed since the early 90s, as I mentioned before, um, with a specific mandate. And that is uh, one of the parts of the mandate is to serve as the monetary policy authority of the euro. But it's very specific. Uh, in the treaty, it is written that what we're talking about is cash money and coin. So there's no, no digital currency whatsoever in the wording in that provision. So amending the wording of the provision, it will take, obviously, amendment of the treaty. That's why it's a very, very difficult project to be achieved, legally speaking. So, um, so the, the European Central Bank is actually has a legitimate mandate to issue those digital currencies. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to follow those developments and to discuss both 
uh, sides of the debate. Um, a, how it works in, in countries that still have such a prominent role of, of, uh, of the monarch or portraits in their banknotes. And of course, the other side of the uh, debate, um, total 100% detachment uh, from any sort of um, currency linked identity, I would say. Thank you very much. Great. So thank you, uh, Varun and Pamela. So what, I, what I'd like to do now is uh, just to introduce a couple of questions for, for Varun and Pamela, and then we'll throw the, uh, throw the questions open to the floor. So interestingly enough, not, notwithstanding your point, Pamela, about the 79% in continental Europe that prefer cash, it's one thing that links... The two ex your two excellent presentations is somehow that the, the question of identity might be behind the curve. Now, what, what I mean by that is if we take um, Varon's uh, presentation, could one say there's an irony in retaining the prominence of the Church of England <coughs> where observance is in continual decline so, principally to ensure the representation of uh, those groups of minorities. And is there a better way of doing that? Would, would the focus on the Church of England become an anachronism? And so coupled with that, um, with pa Pamela's presentation, um, so the questions that certainly we find in continental Europe that people like cash, but it, that's not necessarily the case in the UK context. And is the sense of sort of identity around currency a debate at a time when effectively cash has become a minority sport? Um, and so the idea of identity on notes had resonance as recently as 10 years ago, but the experience of the last five years suggests that we've moved on. Um, so I wondered if you could um, ad address, address those yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very valid point, and I was surprised when I read that survey mm. um, initially because I, I faced that in a few places in Europe. But I thought that's the minority sort of. But apparently, it's not. So Europeans they still prefer cash, apparently based on that survey, and they don't really understand those alternative means of payment. Um, so I, I think, as you said, is 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 it's a bit peculiar uh, as to you know, discussing the way forward, because this is really happening. Digitalization, um, alternative means of payments are everywhere. And I think it's, it's also a matter of what generation is using what. Mm -hmm. um, will this be the case 10 years from now? Will the discussion change, perhaps even in five years from now? So I think it's valid and it's something to revisit, because you wouldn't think now with all these alternative means of payment that cash will add to the identity of, of, of sort of like the whole payment system, system etc. So, yeah, there is a detachment for sure. But in Europe, apparently, that is not happening at the moment. That's why the reluctance, I think, in the whole process of digitalization, I would say. Um, at one level, what you're saying is... Sorry, is that... Yeah. At one level, what you're saying is perfectly legitimate... Uh, if attendance figures so that churches are continuously going down, why keep the established church just to please minorities in various situations? Funnily enough, though, when you do ask whether or not people want to disestablish the Church of England, there aren't that there isn't this great groundswell mm. for doing so. And a little bit like the monarchy in your presentation. If you begin to ask, well, okay, what does this actually entail? It throws up all kinds of technicalities. But if there was democratic support for removing the Church of England, disestablishing it, I mean, I, I would be perfectly willing to say, yes, let's do that. Um, I don't see that support right now. And perhaps most interestingly, I think religious minorities are very keen to keep the established church because they see it as a, a they see it as a voice of religion mm. and the voice of religion somewhere being present is at least something 
and it can also act as a conduit to include other minority religious groups as well. That doesn't happen as easily if there is no established church. And we only need to look at what happens in, for example, France or other parts of Europe other parts of Europe that are more opposed to religion, is the truth, and how minorities are treated there, it is unconscionable to think that there could be, for example, a burqa ban in this country. Mm. When Jack Straw in 2006 raised a debate about removing the niqab and encouraging Muslim women not to wear it, there was very little support for it. It was for sure a national story. But it is, it is unthinkable that it would ever happen. But there have been burqa bans in places like France, mm-hmm. right? There have been burkini bans in places like France. Those who are more secularist are often more opposed to minority faith groups. That is a problem for mm. Jews, Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, and others. Paradoxically, some religion is also a way of including other minority faith groups too. That's interesting. Okay, um, so I think that set us up for some some interesting chat. So um, I'd like to hand it over to, to the audience now. Yes, the gentleman uh, in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> so mine, mine's kind of like a, a question stroke and observation. Uh, I really liked a bit about the currency, uh, actually. Uh, Justin Trudeau actually came out of the weekend and actually, has actually confirmed, would you believe, uh, that the king is actually going to stay on their, on their currency. Uh, so I, I can actually answer that one for you. It is actually going to stay, apparently, for the foreseeable future. But uh, that's, that was more common. But my question is, is compared to... Like, I've become actually an anti-royalist, so to speak, since the queen died uh, and Charles has taken to the throne. I don't actually particularly like Charles as a monarch. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's obviously people like myself that have like, switched allegiance since that last survey was done, but also in other countries, say for example Greece, Germany, France, especially Greece recently, where their former king, uh, Constance II, I believe, died. I wonder if there's actually now a switching to possibly a favouritism of bringing the monarchy back in these countries, i.e. similar to Russia. I know, for example, there's always talk about the Romanovs coming back. Uh, but also, here in this country, like where we have the conversations about Australia and Antigua, I think it is, correct me if I'm wrong, where there's discussions about doing away with the monarchy, uh, if that would create a domino effect to other Commonwealth realms, us included. Uh, I think it was Barbados recently in 2021, so I'm history and politics, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if that can also start a chain reaction in terms of our own discussions in this country about our monarchy being abolished, but say, for example, it being kept in Canada, for example. The first part of the question... Uh, thank you, by the way, for a very interesting question. Um, so the first part of the question, I, I come, it happens, I, I'm from Greece, so uh, that's, that's quite relevant. I've been following quite a lot of the news. So the king and the whole monarchy in Greece, it was, it was totally different. If we have to compare it with the UK, it was linked with a very dark historical moment in Greece. So to answer your question, long story short, no. There's no change of attitude after the king has died. It was just the sort of like a gossip conversation for a few days, um, who attended the funeral, what has happened, you know, end of an era, etc. Uh, but nothing major in terms of, you know, having that symbol anywhere um, in the country because it, it's linked with some, some, some dark moments in, in the history of the country. Um, and it is sort of like the whole concept for Greece. It's perceived as against democracy and, um, yeah, it's not much of an openness there, I would say, for, uh, for, for monarchy, really. Um, it's just a different mentality, and it's a culture thing as well, I believe. In the UK, it, it's totally different. It's, it, you know, the, the monarchy, the, the, the crown is linked with the culture itself, and with, with Great Britain uh, and what it represents, really. It, it does serve as a unifying 
um, element. Uh, the second part of the question, I think you, you were asking about the domino effect. Uh, and I think it's a very, very valid point. Uh, if, I don't know whether that will have a domino effect in the UK because more serious events have happened and you know, the monarchy is there strong <laughs> and nothing has happened. But if we, um, if we are to put it in the Commonwealth countries context, I think that might make a difference. So if Australia now that ought to be uh, a republic, uh, apparently, detaching herself from this Commonwealth links, even in the currencies, as you said, King Charles III uh, won't be included in the fifth Australian dollar, then other Commonwealth countries might follow, especially after um, Queen Elizabeth's death. So I think, I think that's a very valid point, and I tend to agree with that, but in the context of the Commonwealth countries, rather than having a dom domino effect in the UK itself. I think I'd, I'd qualify that slightly. I think if, you, if countries in the Caribbean, for example, uh, wish to become republics, I think you would probably see a domino effect in that region. Uh, because what unites them is often the, the, the legacy of, of slavery and so on. The Australia one is very interesting because historically it's been quite generational. And on paper, you might think that Australia will inevitably move towards a republic because of the demographics of the, of the country. So uh, increasing numbers of uh, Australian citizens are uh, not... UK descendants and in increasingly now not European descendants. But what I'd also say there is beware of the inevitable tide of demographics. Um, and the, the illustration there is with, or the example there is with the United States, where ever since I was an undergraduate student, I've been told that the growth of uh, the Hispanic population in, in the United States will lead to democratic rule forever in the United States. And of course, quite the reverse has happened. Um, so on paper, you might expect Australia to be a sort of a big player in, in, in the movement here. But I, <clears throat> but my suspicion is that it will be rather slower than the, demogra than the demographics would suggest. Uh, like Pamela, I don't think it would spread to the United Kingdom. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the other point you made, actually, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Baron. Well, um, I, I don't see the prospect of monarchies coming back as viable. Um, I, the way I would put it is something like, if I were uh, if I, if I were trying to design a constitution, I do not know how I would defend constitutional monarchy. It is something that exists and we therefore have to think about what we do with it but the innovation from going from a republic to a monarchy I think it would look too much like regression and would be very hard to justify. Um, I'll also say that as Justin sort of hinted at immigration is a huge driver on this so I remember in, I was living in Canada when I was doing my doctorate in Oxford and I, I'd, been, I'd been at traditional Oxford colleges for years. I had never had to, I, I'd never had to sing the national anthem and say God save the Queen or anything. I was living in Canada in Toronto and I was taken to this academic club and we, 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 had, to sing, we, we had to sing God save the Queen. And that happened only in Canada, but that's a very Anglophone part of Canada and over the last 20 years, their immigration levels have changed remarkably such that you do not have the same sort of support. Justin Trudeau is a good liberal. He's declared his war on woke, and that's great, as it were, but also retained certain ideas like Monica the banknote. I, I, I don't see, with immigration trends going in the direction of that popular support to retain a monarchy, um, will increase but what I do think will happen is people will ask the question how do you replace it what do you replace it with if it's an elected head of state then you've got a prime minister's mandate clashing with the mandate of a head of state 
if there is no head of state and you, for example, give those ceremonial duties to the leader of the House of Commons, perhaps somewhere in like Canada, which also has a House of Commons, then you've got to take the leader of the House of Commons out of cabinet. And that then creates a problem for trying to run government legislation. Right? These are incredibly complex issues. Constitutional tinkering, as we all know post-Brexit, is a, is a nightmare. I don't know whether there's that much appetite for that sort of constitutional tinkering, despite the immigration trends that I mentioned before. Yes, this gentleman here. Bahadil Latif. Three excellent presentations, by the way. And I wanted to make a comment about your presentation, which I thought was really quite remarkable. And uh, what occurred to me suddenly is that uh, about the <clears throat> England's colonial possessions in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, because there the problem, or if you can call it a problem, is that uh, the sort of the uh, colonialist migrant population, which is primarily British, uh, uh, is very antagonistic to the idea that, or rather I think they reject the idea of separation from motherland. They're opposed to the idea of becoming integrated to the environment they now inhabit, even to give up the idea of the past, past meaning their connection with the with colonialist uh, migrant past. So the result is, of course, they want to continue keeping the the monarch as head of state and to keep monarch at the forefront in currency and so forth. And that contrasts with what has happened in Europe, of course. And that's what Arthur was fascinated to, to hear that. Of course, the narrative in England is slightly different. I mean, of course, the monarch is our head of state, and as, as the presentation showed, that actually much of the population is still um, enamored with the idea of a non-democratic society, hereditary relationship with the past, even when the, the monarch, unlike the subjects of the nation, doesn't pay taxes, for example doesn't even pay inheritance tax. And despite the fact that he doesn't actually, he or the, the monarch doesn't pay inheritance tax, that discussion is not even allowed to happen. By the way, Europeans are quite horrified, I'm sure in Greece as well, horrified that subjects are not allowed to ask a question about the, uh, the relationship between the monarch, his money, and whether the state has any role in gaining something from that, you know? So it's a rem I think most of Europe doesn't understand this from what I understand. And of course, the, the idea about the surveys that were shown, the polls, now I, again, I think this is concocted very often, partly because there isn't much discussion in the nation Hardly. In fact, for example, the queen, who's now become the queen, the consort queen, she was a highly unpopular figure, incredibly unpopular. Yet, a narrative and concocted millions of pounds were spent to try and create a softer version of this person. But I know the underneath that, a very large section of this country's population actually abhor her. You know? Of course, the problem is that it's like the Queen. We don't know her. Apparently, we have no idea about her intellect, her knowledge, her veracity about any subject matter, except that we're always told by the BBC that apparently she is an incredibly knowledgeable person about world issues, of the Commonwealth. You know, she cares about, what does she care about? But the narrative is presented. In that. So the problem is the narrative, the established narrative. Sorry to continue with this. You have to stop me at some point. Can I? A, qu a question. Yes, there yeah. is a question. I, I think uh, 
I, I want the three of you to tell me whether in a democracy, in a, in, a, in a modern democracy, in a European democracy, in a liberal democracy, the idea of a, of a head of state, who's also the, the pope of the nation, I, thought, I don't know if the anointing section was the most amazing, you know, when the whole he was covered up, and of course God anointed him to become the new emperor of the Christian church. It was the most amazing, amazing happening. One of the most powerful moments in my life, actually, I've ever witnessed. Um, what I want to know is, is any of that really legitimate? The fact that the guy doesn't pay any taxes, the fact that he's inherited billions of pounds, and none of that is accounted for by the state, yet we claim to be a liberal democracy. I mean, what is the justification for that? I mean, just on, on the... Sorry. Point. No, 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 no not, not at all. Just on the point of fact that the, the, the uh, king actually does pay tax. Um, but, you know, whether or not it's defensible, I mean, I think I defer to Varon's point here. If you were designing a constitution from scratch, it would be enormously difficult to, to justify what, what you have. But at the same time, what you find with many countries across the world is you have a settlement that emerges that works or doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, it gets replaced. And so Britain is not alone in having a constitutional monarchy. Within Europe, we have one in Denmark, we have one in the Netherlands, and you can have a, a ceremonial monarchy as they have in Japan. Um, and I think it's perfectly consistent to say in an ideal world is it reasonable for people to have privilege by virtue of birth but at the same time say well okay does does the system as such work for, for the nation work, work for the individual and I, th I don't think the two are incompatible so if the question is how can we defend hereditary privilege? So there's all sorts of things about the, the way we do government that are very difficult to defend, um, you know, right down to the costumes that are used uh, in the state opening of parliament. But does it work? I think it, it is the key thing. And, and as, as Varon pointed out, you know, one of the questions is that if you, if you get rid of that, a whole lot of things follow, and what would be the ideal, what would be the, you know, the best replacement for that? So if your question is, can you be a Democrat and defend monarchy, which I think, if I'm paraphrasing, it seemed to me what you were getting at, I think the answer to that question is yes, because monarchies work, uh, sorry, uh, democracies work differently in different countries and what, what works in one country may work very badly in another. I'll give you an example. So one of the areas I do a lot of research on is on the funding of politics, funding of parties. So I've done a lot of work with the Council of Europe, going around various countries, uh, helping them with their laws to make sure it works. And what's very clear about what we accept in Britain as a good way of working would fail miserably if it was imposed in Poland, in Italy, and so on and so forth. And so I, think, I do think it's important to think about what works in the culture uh, in which somebody's living. But I also think it's important to not to take people for fools. There's no question that there are narratives around certain things, but equally people aren't stupid and they can see through it. Um, so I wouldn't be so suspicious of people's expressed views um, because, the, you know, they are what they are. And always remember, you know, people go on about newspapers shaping opinion. Relatively few people read newspapers, far fewer than used to be, that was the case in the past. Um, in the interest of time, I hope you don't mind, can we move to the next question? Sure. Yeah, this gentleman over here. 
Yeah, I have a question about the representation of the monarchy in the banknotes, I mean, in both UK and Europe. I think um, in the UK case, I mean, uh, the choice, I mean, that was presented seemed to be the monarch, I mean, the image of the monarch himself or herself. Um, why, for example, are the members of the royal uh, family not chosen to be represented? And also, in addition to using personal image, I mean, um, could or for example, could um, like palaces, I mean, architectures, other symbols uh, be chosen as well? I mean, have they been considered and then maybe disregarded as a result? Um, yeah, that's the question for the UK banknotes. And then when it comes to Europe, I think what was quite interesting is that those architectural features chosen were, they seem to me like Gothic, Roman, like more historical. Um, but if EU wanted to present a postmodern identity, um, why didn't they choose some more modern architectural features? Let's say modernist architectures, Bauhaus, um, or even more recent. I mean, like Daniel Lipskin. I mean, there are lots of architectural masters, and then they are even more cross-cultural, more postmodern. Um, what What do you think were the um, considerations behind these decisions? Question. Um, I think, to be honest, um, iconography and the design of those um, figures were highly debated and well thought. And I think they, they've chosen the most influential, historical, I would say, um, not only monuments, but also, as I mentioned before, it had to be an historical link and a link with integration, let's say a bridge, right? Mm -hmm. Or a window to, to sort of like signify, symbolize this openness. So I think you narrow down a bit more, sort of like the building, <coughs> the, 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 the things that you can actually include there. Um, and it's all about this cross-border element as well. So um, postmodern, as you said before, yes, but postmodern is not only contemporary 2000s sort of thing. I think it, the whole postmodern um, iconography of currency, it's around 70s, 80s. Uh, that's why it's not really called modern era so it's it's sort of like um located there and this this i believe what i read is one of the underlying reasons i'm, I'm not obviously um into iconography or anything but uh, as far as i'm concerned that's the underlying reason and they were very carefully picked to sort of like tick a few boxes integration history uh and obviously you know pieces of art as well and also for fraud prevention all these um, uh, geographic patterns as well were carefully selected. Um, the, the Europa, sort of like a mytho mytho mythology creature, the Greek mythology creature, was also uh, very ancient, but still part of these um, uh, currencies that represents Europe. Hopefully this addresses your question. Now the first part, I think you asked why other members of the royal family are not included in the banknotes. Uh, it, it's meant to be the head of state, isn't it? Sorry. It's meant to be the head of state. Mm. Um, the other active members, um, working members of the royal family, I don't think that they, 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 they represent, they are the head of state. So it's, it's the monarch is the head of state, hence the representation. But that's just my uh, sort of like argument, elaboration. I don't know whether you know anything more than this. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question because the, the refreshments are out there and they're waiting for us. So, yes, this gentleman here. Can you hear me? No. Yes. yes. Yeah. I have a very simple question for you. Um, we've touched on minorities and commonwealth. If we keep them aside for a minute, um, what is the current role of monarchy in the context of the home nations is a bond of unity. And um, how do you see that evolving in the future and time to come, whether it will erode or enhance or, or what? Well, I mean, it's, it's a real challenge. Uh, and this was what I was alluding to about the dangers of slimming down the monarchy, because as the UK has become, in some ways, more divided, uh, particularly in Scotland, to a lesser extent in Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, if, if 
the monarchy is going to continue to be supported in the sort of the nations other than England, it's important that the crown of the monarchy has a has a role there. So I think it plays a, a very important role. Um, although interestingly, even at the height of the Scottish independence campaign in 2014, the SNP was very clear that the Queen would remain the head of state. More interesting, I think, is Northern Ireland. Um, and again, beware the tide of demographics, but very shortly Northern Ireland will become a majority Catholic uh, part of the UK. And whether or not, uh, going back to, to Varon's point about whether or not defender of faiths, is that the correct expression, will, will cut ice in a, in a part of the UK that is of a completely different part of the Christian church, I think remains to be seen. So I think it's important, um, you know, but it's one of those questions, you know, at the moment, all parts of the UK are more in favour than not. Um, it looks like the, the march of Scottish independence is receding. I think the, the, the next area where we, may, where we may see some change is, is potentially in Northern Ireland. Um, but I don't, I don't know if Farron, Pamela, you want to add anything to that? Do you want to? I, I think I agree with your point. I have got nothing to add. I mean, that, I have no crystal ball, right? So I, I don't know what's going to happen. But one way of thinking about the contemporary monarchy is as a, a clash of two fundamental democratic principles. Fundamental democratic principle number one is the equal status of all citizens. It's that equal status of all citizens that makes us equal before the law, gives all of us the same rights and the same obligations, means that each of us has only one vote, not two, for example. That equal status is quite a fundamental democratic principle. But so is the fundamental democratic principle that the majority decides. And polls currently suggest that we still have a majority in favour of the monarchy. To ensure that the monarchy continues, I think King Charles is going to have to work very hard to appeal to that other democratic principle, the equal status of citizens, to make himself not look like an anachronism. If he can do that, then he doesn't look out of touch in a contemporary democracy. And to do that, he must, at least in part, include minorities in the ways in which I was describing. Great. Well, on that note, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today and for asking such excellent questions. Um, as you know, this is part of a series of sessions of the Brunel Research Festival, and I hope you'll be able to attend uh, many more, either in person or, in or online. Uh, a little flag for one that's coming up next week uh, on electoral integrity and modernising elections, uh, which I'm involved in. Uh, that, that's in the programme, and it promises to be an absolute cracker. So, um, on that note, uh, thank you for coming. There are refreshments outside and sandwiches, I believe. So, fill your boots. And thank you once again. Thank you.